What's going on doll fans? It is your boy Dylan and I'm making a relatively quick video. I'll try and keep it as short as I possibly can, but there are a couple things that I did want to talk about. First and foremost, um, there's this article on Bleacher Report and it's talking about all of the biggest weaknesses for each and every team. And so for the Miami Dolphins, they talk about how the front office is the biggest weakness of the team. Let me get to it. The Miami Dolphins have completely gutted their own roster. And while that strategy could pay off in the long run, could being the, the, the key word there, it has cost the 2019 version of the team dearly. And I would argue that it's going to cost the 2020 uh, version of the team, the 2021 version of the team, because it's not going to be a turnaround just like that. Anyway, could Miami have been decent this season? Yes, they absolutely could if they would have kept the same players and the same team that they had from last year that was far better than the team that they had in 2016 that went to the playoffs. Okay, and everybody wants to fucking shit on Gase and fucking you know, say that like, you know, Brian Flores or whatever, and this regime is going to get drafts right when their first one has been massively underwhelming to this point. Although to be fair, nowhere near proper evaluation until they've reached the end of their rookie contracts, but so far been very underwhelming. Um, and I mean, the Gase drafts were great. Devon Godshaw and Mike Gesicki, some of the players that are coming on now for Brian Flores were Gase picks and were first developed by him. You know, Minka Fitzpatrick was a brilliant pick. Laramie Tunsil, brilliant pick, but they were cast aside by this regime. So it's just ridiculous. Anyway, despite an unbelievable lack of talent on both sides of the ball, they're playing extremely hard for rookie head coach Brian Flores. Again, I disagree with that. I don't think they're playing for him at all. Yes, okay, there have been some, you know, after their first win, they gave Brian Flores a bath. Okay, but they were excited for their win, and, um, you know, things like that are natural uh, along the way, right? Natural congratulations to everybody that happens to be there, but at the same time, and I'm sure that there are some players that are definitely on board or whatever, but there are, uh, I'm sure, players in this organization that, and it will continue to grow, my guess is, um, the longer that they go with this being a disaster, right? So, in other words, okay, they might have been able to temper some of the, uh, the disagreements in the locker room because the players themselves happen to... Um, you know, overcome a bad Jets team and win and a Colts team that was struggling without, um, you know, starters and whatever. They were the players on the field were able to put that that effort on the field. They might be able to uh, because of that temper it also because, you know, they can make bullshit excuses for their calls on the field and so on, and so forth that have caused us to lose games and put us in bad position. They can make excuses for why Bobby McCain is playing a position that he's never played before and then subsequently gets massively injured and has to get shut down for the season and then have surgery. So, you know, all these excuses can be made, but as this plays out and proves to be a total disaster, you're going to have more and more people jumping ship and not want to be here. Um, and again, they're playing for their careers and their their livelihood. It's their paychecks, it's their dream, and all of that. So I believe that they're playing far more for that than they are playing for the, the head coach who um, is part of this whole thing. Let me continue though. And after a comically ugly 0-4 start, which by the way, this Bills game looked a lot more like the early games uh, than it did the the previous games as far as quality of play and outcome um and the 20 points that we scored frankly again i mean that that was a little bit misleading because one seven of that was on uh you know special teams um overall the offense played like absolute garbage we did take advantage of you know some penalties on them that helped us out on drives blah 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 so and the players are playing hard it's getting them you know massively injured um you know whatever like we're like the difference between at this point the difference between last year and this year as far as injuries go is is there was literally nothing that um, any of the coaching staff or whatever could do about the injuries last year, right? They they just happened. 
In most cases, you say that. In this case, you don't say that, and the coaching staff and, and the regime get um, blame for these, these players getting hurt because of how systemically bad that they designed this team to be. Okay, so when you take a uh, you take a team and you design them systemically to be a quality of product that is far less than the competition than what they are going to be facing, you are inherently going to get these players hurt. So in this particular case, it is absolutely the fault of the front office and the coaching staff. You cannot exclude the coach. And as a matter of fact, there are people that then will be like, oh no, it's it's Patrick Graham. Or like most people will admit that this front office has set us up for failure. And then people will even say that like Patrick Graham is calling bad plays and he should be fired. But for some reason, everybody just wants to exclude Flores like he has no part of this whatsoever. Let, which is absolutely fucking insane. But then people like Omar Kelly will say, yeah, he's got a ton of input in this upcoming draft. Really? Really? You can't have it both ways. Either he's involved and part of it, or he's not. Also, the third and 20 play against the Steelers. It's not like he's not on the headset. It's not like he can't see it for himself. It's not like he doesn't know what's about to happen. He could... Worst case scenario, he could be like, call another timeout uh, because we need to change this play and it's it's going to potentially end up in a disaster. But no, he didn't. He also could object to the fact that Xavier Howard wasn't shadowing Juju Smith-Schuster or object to the fact that Shaq Calhoun, one of your best offensive linemen, mysteriously, for no reason, popped up on the inactives list even though he wasn't hurt or anything. Especially last game when we had injuries to our offensive line. Evan Bame and Julian Davenport got injured. So what is the excuse? Why does Brian Flores not get the credit he deserves? I give him credit for the good things he does, for the good kind of aggressive, and I have. I gave him credit for extending Xavier and Howard. But the handful of good things that he's done is far outweighed and far outshadowed by all of the bad things that he does. And he is absolutely, 100%, unequivocally, part of this franchise's philosophy and decision to be bad. He has responsible responsibility and culpability over the uh, the the design of this team, the systemic design of this team. And then he gets even more uh, culpability by his terrible decisions that in other cases might seem to be, you know, maybe just rookie mistakes, rookie head coach mistakes or blah, blah, blah. But when you have as much experience as he has in the NFL and furthermore, once when, when, since you came from an organization like the Patriots, and then on top of that, when you throw into the context that the entire philosophy of this season was to tank and to be bad, to get as many draft picks as we can and as high a picks as we can, it's absolutely absurd to then say, oh, but Brian Flores is the only one dissenting in this entire thing. Brian Flores is the only guy that really doesn't want to do this. And But what is he going to do? He's just been given these cards. Well, I'll tell you what he could have done. He could have said no. He could have done like Adam Gase did and said no. Okay, they went two and three during that five game stretch, but they held second half leads in two of those three losses. And the other, uh, and the other came by a single point against the Washington Redskins. Okay, let's pause there for a quick second. In those games, the evidence points to the players doing it, not him. Not him. Okay? So, in the Washington Redskins game, we were getting our ass handed to us the entire game. It was more of a defensive game. Both offenses were struggling pretty mightily. Overall, it was low scoring in a defensive heavy game. Your defense was proving to keep them off the field for the most part. They did score 17 points, whatever. But for the most part, they were doing well. And then your offense came to life when you did put Ryan Fitzpatrick in. So that was ultimately ended up being a good decision. But full context, he was playing against a bad team that was very much um, tired at that point. And he was just fresh legs and so on and so forth. So it's not like, it's not like, you know, you made some over, overly spectacular decision that, 
to put in some like absolutely amazing player that just totally changed all because of himself. No, that's not the full context. And you did it in part because your starting quarterback was playing like shit and your entire team was playing like shit. But good on them for trying something that, that gives you a spark and it did. And we got close. But then when it came down to it with six seconds left in the game, you make the worst possible decision that you can. You decide to call a play, okay, maybe you practiced it all week, but you decide to call a play on a two-point conversion attempt, okay, that first and foremost was a bad call because you only have six seconds left in the game. The game is going to end after this play unless you either, or unless you win, or unless you tie it, right? The game will end after this. Either you're going to lose or you're going to win depending depending on how successful this attempt is. Okay? But the probability of getting that two-point conversion, just getting a two-point conversion in general, right? Taking out play design and all the rest of that for now, just the two-point conversion in general is far less likely to occur than the extra point to tie the game. So this was a terrible choice in aggressive uh, behavior. Terrible decision to be aggressive. Now, again, people can look at it and say that, oh, it was just, you know, a bad choice by a rookie head coach. Or maybe you say it's, a, you know, bad coaching and he's inept and not good at his job. But in the full context of everything, especially considering the fact that the Redskins are one of the teams that is challenging us for a top position in this draft, it's absolutely ridiculous to say that they didn't make that decision on purpose. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Especially because then you acknowledge, a lot of people will acknowledge that the front office did this on purpose and designed this team to be bad on purpose. Okay, but then let's look at the play call itself. The play call itself was totally outmatched based off of the, um, uh, the numbers. They had two blockers for four defenders. It was going to get blown up even if Kenyon Drake did catch the ball. But then you add on to the fact that Kenyon Drake wasn't even the guy that practiced it all week. He didn't even take a single rep. So why would you decide to keep the guy, Mark Walton, out who did practice it all week? The evidence piles up. And then they make some lame-ass excuse that he had a thumb injury. And they put him on the injury report with that thumb injury. But then guess what? He practiced all week just fine, no problems. He played the very next game and was a heavy part of the offense in the or um, a significant part of the offense, had reps and had plays in the very next game. Didn't seem to have anything on his hand. I mean, he had his, uh, you know, like nothing special, nothing wrapped up on his thumb. Why? Because it was total bullshit. Because all they were trying to do was try and save their ass and try and save face and have some sort of plausible excuse for their decision to cover up the fact that they did it on purpose. That they did it on purpose. Okay? They put the team in the worst probable chance to have success. All, prob all probability, all odds were against them. As bad as the odds could be, they put themselves in that position. And lo and behold, the outcome was not successful. Also, in that game stretch, yes, we kept it closer against bad teams. The only team in there that is above 500 right now is the Bills, and they just beat us again. Pretty bad, I might add. Okay, so it, it's... People just are devoid of reality. They refuse to put things in full context. It's important because your outcomes and your analysis and your your realizations are very different when you when you put things in full context as opposed to when you just like cherry pick certain things. They covered the point spread in all five uh, before essentially running out of gas and a 17 point loss to the Buffalo Bills on Sunday. Also, in case of like the Jets win, again, that was a bad team with a lot of internal turmoil. Although, again, they have kind of picked things up over the past couple weeks and pretty decisively won games. And Sam Darnold has uh, performed pretty well in his past two games. Yes, full context because I give it to you. The last game that they played was against the bad Washington Redskins, 
but they have had a, a pretty good convincing two game turnaround uh, the past couple weeks and their organization doesn't have the philosophy and the um, the the context of we are intentionally tanking this season that directive was sent down from Steven Ross through his ranks and Flores is not excluded in fact he was hired in large part because he would acquiesce to that demand whereas the 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 Jets organization has just had turmoil for a while they just they've had uh, front office issues with that's why they fired their old coach and brought in Adam Gase that's not Adam Gase's fault that's why they fired the GM midway through the season that's why they were having problems with players like Leonard Williams and Jamal Adams prior to Gase getting there not his fault but Gase gets blamed for it which is absolutely ridiculous but then they will not blame Flores for the things that are very clearly uh partly his decision and partly um in his uh realm of culpability right it's not all him i'm not saying flores deserves all of it but the rest of his coaching staff does as well so does the front office and so does stephen ross but they all deserve um responsibility accountability and culpability for the things that they do have say in so Brian Flores does have say in the roster and the personnel that are on this team. He wasn't excluded from the conversations when the front office was like, oh, we're just going to cut everybody or trade everybody. Are you fucking joking me? Or at the very least, at the very least, he wasn't part of those conversations because he made it clear right from the get go when he was hired that he's OK with all of this. Anyway. If the uh, tank job works, if, major if, this will all be worth it. But the Dolphins easily could be 5-5 five and five rather than 2-8 and eight right now. In fact, I would venture to guess that we'd actually be a lot better than 5-5, five and five, more than just 5 and 500. Um, if we would have had the same team, because again, we started last year 3-0. and oh, The team was lighting it up in the first few weeks until the injuries the non-stop injuries that just decimated us, not just our, our starting lineup, but our backups as well. And with Minka Fitzpatrick, Kiko Alonso, Laramie Tunsil, Kenny Stills, Robert Quinn, Danny Amendola, Ted Larson, TJ McDonald, Dwayne Allen, Andre Branch, Josh Sitton, and Bryce Butler, I'd also throw in there Ryan Tannehill, Cameron Wake, Frank Gore, uh, they'd perhaps be a playoff contender in the wide open AFC. In fact, we actually could be giving the Bills and the Patriots a run for their money. But they parted ways with all of those players to focus on the future, the far future, which put them far from contention with a roster that isn't remotely NFL caliber. And again, it blows my mind that people will acknowledge the fact that this roster is nowhere near NFL caliber, but then they will not fucking give this organization, including Flores, responsibility and culpability over the fact that these players are getting injured. I mean, seriously, if you took a, um, if you took a high school team and put them up against a college team, what do you think would happen? Those high school kids are going to get murdered. They're going to, you know, figuratively speaking, hopefully, but they're going to get mauled and they're going to get hurt. What do you expect? All right. Anyway, I think you guys at this point get get the idea. Um, let's move on. So I wanted to there's another report from Bleacher Report. Former first round NFL draft picks with the most untapped potential. Okay, so we actually, the Dolphins actually have two uh, players on this list. Uh, there was eight of them all together. Josh Rosen, quarterback in Miami Dolphins, is the first one. Former UCLA quarterback Josh Rosen was one of the top quarterback, excuse me, prospect, prospects in the 2018 draft. In the eyes of some, he was, in most, it, it, he was its most polished prospect. Josh Rosen's footwork and mechanics make him... Uh, as pretty a quarterback as you will find in this year's draft, NFL Media's Lance Zierlein wrote before the draft. 
Since he was drafted by the Arizona Cardinals, virtually everything has been stacked against Rosen. He suffered from terrible offensive line play as a rookie. He was sacked 45 times in 14 games along with a lack of weapons. He was then traded to the Miami Dolphins who have traded away several key players for future draft picks. Stop right there for a second. Now again, I've been saying that I think quarter that Josh Rosen could be a very good quarterback in this league, but he's been given the worst hands he could be possibly given. Now I do think it says something about him that the Cardinals were just so ready to get rid of him the way that they did, and that the um, Dolphins have subsequently decided that he's not worth playing, like at all. Um, I do think that that says something about him. However, the dude's been given no help whatsoever. He's been put in worse positions than Ryan Tannehill was in his first four se or his first two seasons to this point. Having said that, though, Ryan Tannehill also did outperform Josh Rosen in his first two seasons by far. But having said that, again, it's uh not his fault and he could be a lot better right but then also um well and, and it was but that also goes to show you that it was stupid that the dolphins did what they did and traded the picks this year's second and a fifth from next year for what for what just another uh terrible decision on them that you can uh that is part of a long list that you can use to foreshadow how the future is going to go but also, it also goes to show you that it's not where you pick, but how you pick, right? Because who the quarterbacks that were taken above him, who were they? Josh Allen, who's now balling out for the Bills and, and leading them to a, a, um, a push for the playoffs. Sam Darnold, who unfortunately is in a terrible position right now with the Jets, um, but has, has uh, most recently had two really wonderful games. In, in his past two game uh, past two games which were wins and I do think that uh with Gase in time they can get it fixed um we'll have to see how that plays out but then Lamar Jackson was taken at 32nd overall and then the Arizona Cardinals moved up to go get Josh Rosen right they moved one pick ahead of the Dolphins to go get him and everybody could, was like, oh man, the 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 um, the Dolphins could have gotten Josh Rosen at number 11. And I guarantee you, Stephen Ross would have loved that because he made it clear that he didn't want to take Minka Fitzpatrick, but he did want, but he did want a quarterback. But the regime, Adam Gase and Chris Greer, to his credit, uh, for that particular thing, decided no. We don't need a quarterback that badly because we have one that's at the very least uh, a really good, great quarterback. And if if the team around him is built properly, he can prove that, which he has with the Titans so far in his in his four starts. OK, um, and instead, we're going to take this dynamic playmaker on the back end at a position we actually really need to improve at. And then subsequently, he tells Adam Gase, well, no, you know, because of things out of your control, we had a disappointing season. And now I am stubborn and, uh, and, and foolish and don't know how to make proper decisions and don't know how to actually build an NFL team the right way. So I'm going to demand that you tank the season to go get a quarterback. Okay. And then not only that, look at Tua. Look at what happened to him. They say it's going to take like five months or whatever, and he's going to start playing again. But there is massive potential that this could end his career either now or massively shorten it. And the 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 likelihood of his career, he okay, the likelihood of him having a 15, 20 year or more career as a franchise quarterback of a team is severely unlikely at this point. With the two ankle surgeries, both ankles, and now this hip problem. Like, come on. Okay, but anyway, uh, he was then traded to the Miami... Okay, I read that. The Miami offense is devoid of playmakers, and that's made it difficult for Rosen to succeed. He's also been in and out of the starting lineup due to the presence of journeyman Ryan Fitzpatrick. 
though the arm talent and football IQ appear to be present, although there were some reports that he was struggling a bit to pick up this offense, but what have you. Uh, there's still no telling how good of a pro Rosen can be. That's likely to remain a mystery until Rosen finds himself on a roster with a su uh, solid supporting cast and coaching staff willing to give him a full season run. And I absolutely agree with that last point because I've been saying that this whole time. It, and But that also goes to how can you even properly evaluate a lot of the guys that are on this team right now when you systemically made them to be so bad that they're, you know, equivalent to like, like I said, a, a high school team playing a college team or a D1 team, you know, playing uh, a really good NFL team or, you know, even just an average NFL team, right? So, I mean... And also why this, this organization is partly at least culpable for the, the, um, the injuries that they've had. But this, and this article in particular proves that yet again, adds more to the list of how, you know, their evaluation is just terrible. There, I mean, what, what do we really have? What does, what does this organization really have on their list? When, when you, when, when you look at all the players that they've gotten rid of, cut or traded, and the quality of players that they are. Um, when you look at um, the eight AAF guys that they brought in in the offseason and not a single one of them stuck. The 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 defensive tackle from Brazil didn't work out. Um, you know, they've been cutting guys throughout the season. Um, let's see. Robert Condici got released. One of their former first round pick, the former first round picks that they tried to throw a flyer on. Josh Rosen's not working out. Uh, Preston Williams now, one of their bright spots, has a season ending injury and we'll have to just wait and see if, if he can return. Mark Walton got suspended and then released because of his problems. I, I mean, what can you really point at to say that this credit or that this coaching staff and this regime knows what they're doing. Okay, Devontae Parker's having the best season of his career. Okay, you can give them some credit, but part of that is because he's finally actually legitimately healthy because that was one of the main problems with him this entire time is he, he couldn't stay healthy, but why was that? But that was also part because of his immaturity. Now, I would also say that he has developed in his maturity because of the development that he got and the, the help he got from the previous regime, which was the majority of his time so far in the NFL, but uh, which was the regime that he was with for the majority of his time in the NFL. Also, guys like Mike Gesicki, that was a Gase pick who started his development, but somehow Brian Flores is getting all of it. And it's not like he's even that spectacular. He's improved a little bit, right? Vince Beagle, okay, he's a he's a decent acquisition and has played well for us, but not overly spectacular. The first draft that they've done has been underwhelming in their first year. So where does this organization build some level of confidence that they're going to get it right? Anyway, moving on, the next player that they have on this list, Taco Charlton, defensive end. Pass rusher Taco Charlton was drafted by the Dallas Cowboys with the 28th pick in the 2017 draft. While he showed some promise as a situational pass rusher, Charlton was mostly a backup in his first two seasons with Dallas. Then he was a healthy scratch for two weeks in 2019 before being released. Now, pause right there for a second. That's an organization that has historically hit on most of their draft picks, especially their first round picks. It's super rare. I disagree with Jerry Jones on a lot of things, but it's super rare for them to fuck up with their picks, especially their first round picks. So it says a lot that they were going to get rid of him. That's the first thing. Charlton was claimed by the Dolphins and started to realize some of his potential amassing four and a half sacks, or excuse me, four sacks in seven games. That's the same number of sacks Charlton had in his two seasons with the Cowboys. Okay, stop there. Yes, he has four sacks. Yes, he leads the team, but he's also not playing now. So either he's hurt, which drops his stock, or the coaching staff just decided to keep him out for absolutely no reason or not a good reason. Um, and then that's their stock down. Either way, somebody's fucking stock goes down and it's not really good 
for this situation that we're in. But also, if you look at the if you look at the sacks, two of the sacks that he had for sure were just cleanup sacks that he shouldn't have got. The one that I point out most that I usually point out is the Dak Prescott one. He shouldn't have got that sack. Dak Prescott should have thrown the ball away far sooner than he did. He just decided to keep it and Charlton gets a sack to his name. Okay? But that wasn't anything special that he did. Was it good good on him to keep uh to keep pushing through the end of the whistle? Absolutely. But every player should do that. Even the worst of them. Okay? So full context here. Perhaps Charlton wasn't a good fit for coordinator Rod Marinelli's defense. Perhaps Miami head coach Brian Flores has recognized how to get more out of the former Michigan star. Yeah, okay. Miami is not loaded with defensive talent, so Charlton could continue being a key cog for Flores moving forward. If so, the Dolphins might be able to unleash the potential that Dallas couldn't, and a double-digit sack season could be on the horizon. To be fair, we don't know yet. He's still in his rookie contract, so uh, you got to give him that leeway. And statistically speaking, he has improved in his short time here, but we'll see how that plays out. And uh, there's still not anywhere near enough evidence to say that he's going to get close to having a double digit sack season anytime soon. That needs to happen or he needs to get close to it before uh, we, we as fans or as analysts or as whatever go in that direction. Um, also, the quality of his sacks need to to increase they they don't need to just be i mean if you get some cleanup sacks in there sometimes that's great but you also need to show consistency that you yourself based off of your abilities your skill set your technique your smartness blah 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 can get hard sacks right that you can beat and and to be fair at least one of his sacks, and I talk about this, he did do well at, right? He came around the corner really well. He beat his blocker, which I think was a tight end. Although, also, to be fair, to be in full context in that, it wasn't the lineman. It was just a um, uh, tight end who was brought in to kind of chip him. But, okay, he beats the tight end, he gets around the corner, and then subsequently also the right tackle, because I believe it was on that side, and he gets a sack on the quarterback. Good for him, but you need to show that more consistently before we start saying that, you know, Brian Flores is tapping into his potential and, you know, he's going to have a double-digit sack season. Now, they weren't saying that definitively, to be fair to them, but... We're not even close to that yet. And in fact, he's cl far closer to being a bust than he is um, having a double-digit sack season. Um, anyway, so uh, just real quick, a couple comments from like Brian Flores. Brian Flores on edge setting. We've had guys who have become more consistent as the season has gone on. Mentions Vince Beagle and Charles Harris, Charles Harris as two guys who have made clear progress. Okay. I would say that Vince Beagle has made clear progress when you juxtapose it to how his previous seasons have gone. I mean, he hardly even played. He had one tackle to his name prior to coming here to the Dolphins. So in that regard, yeah, he has made clear progress and he has been one of the minor bright spots because again, he hasn't been um, spectacular or anything. He's been like average, but he has had a couple flashes. Okay, and a couple good things here and there. So comparatively, yeah, he's made progress, but progress again to what? To maybe average is about where he's at right now. Kiko Alonso has 10 plus interceptions in his career, not to mention over 550 tackles. Okay, you know, whatever. Flores says the Dolphins chose to activate Andrew Van Ginkle off IR instead of Jonathan Ledbetter because he was healthier. Okay. That's relatively reasonable, except for the fact that your defensive line and your pass rush is absolutely atrocious, and linebacker is probably the best unit you have. So you don't really need more backup at linebacker when you have McMillan, Iguavin, Baker, um... 
Charles Harris is technically playing linebacker. Although, again, I mean, what has he done? He hasn't really improved. And what he did at Missouri was a specialist at um, being uh, an edge rusher, right? He was a specialist at being an edge rusher at Missouri. And now he's being played as a linebacker and hasn't done anything. So where is the clear progress? It's just foolish. It's just stupid. Anyway, but then uh, Jonathan Ledbetter. I mean, he's not like, you know, some big dame or anything like that. But he did in the preseason and has in the past shown potential of being a decent pass rusher. And we don't have one not right now. And Taco Charlton's out right now. So if he's healthy enough to come back, I mean, you've already proven that you, you're willing to put massively bruised and banged up players like Bobby McCain on the field so they can get more injured so that way you end up having to put them on, on IR. So it's just another lame, hollow excuse that they're just trying to use to cover up for the fact that they are not trying to win and that they are trying to fucking, especially now, because they do have a couple wins under their belt, right? They're trying to ensure that they get the highest pick possible because the directive from uh, Stephen Ross was go get a fucking quarterback. And so they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. They're trying to say, yeah, see, we weren't tanking. We weren't tanking. We won a couple games. That automatically proves it. Despite the fact that we systemically, from top to bottom, designed this team to be as bad as possible. Despite the fact that we shipped out all of our proven talent, leadership, production, all of that stuff, just so that way we could get draft picks and cap space. And we're probably going to continue to do that, as Rashad Jones probably won't be here, and other players, and we're going to almost assuredly have a massive purge yet again on, the, on this roster. Um, but... They're trying to have their cake and eat it too, saying, oh yeah, see, we're not tanking despite those other factors that clearly indicate your attempt to tank at the very least. And then, of course, the, the on-field decisions, the, the consistent um, and terrible use of timeouts and challenges, the plays and calls on the field, uh, the misuse of players, the, the random uh, uh, healthy players being put on an active list, Blah, 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 blah. Even stuff like that. Right? The decision to bring in Andrew Van Ginkle, a guy who's been on IR this whole time, who hasn't really had any playing time or practice time with the team, who hasn't been in there, who isn't, you know, and your linebacker unit is the, the, the unit you need the least amount of help on. But you absolutely need a ton of help on the defensive line. So people can keep making excuses all they want. This thing is going to turn out to be a disaster. Brian Flores is going to end up getting scapegoated. Maybe some people in the front office as well. But when you look at Stephen Ross's history, he's proven that overwhelmingly he tends to piecemeal it and just have like one or two people that he scapegoats but leaves part of the other, uh, other people in the regime because somehow they're not the problem. Uh, but it's only these people. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. And then, and then, you know, whatever. Anyway, I, I'm sorry, though. Let me be careful because, again, I don't know that for 100% certainty. Although, so let me be clear and, and, and because I do hate, I do, it does, it does bother me when people say just so declaratively that this is going to happen 100% for sure. I don't know that. And they can still prove me wrong um but so far the overwhelming evidence points to that this is going to be a massive disaster and that is my prediction and my perspective that this is going to end up turning out to be a massive failure and blow up in all of their faces and it's going to push this it's not only going to you know put us in the basement of the league for the next few years but then it's going to push this organization back um five to ten years maybe i don't even know um yeah so raekwon mcmillan has a brace on his left knee so there's that um yeah matt infante okay a tweet from him let's play a game let's assume a directive has come down from stephen ross to chris greer that he must draft a quarterback with their first pick first of all there's no assuming, 
okay? Again, this context and this framing, rather, is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. There's no assuming it, okay? Look at the data that we have. Last year, Stephen Ross wanted to take a quarterback and not Minka Fitzpatrick. After last season, he fires Adam Gase, partly because of things he didn't have control over, like players getting injured, hurricanes, blah, blah, blah. And also because Stephen Ross, and there was reporting on this, that Stephen Ross went to uh, Adam Gase and said, I want you to tank this season to get a quarterback high in the 2020 draft, and he refused. Okay, so he refuses, gets fired, because he wouldn't acquiesce to it. And then other reports indicated that in the search for a new coach, they made it very clear that this was their philosophy going in. Brian Flores clearly acquiesced. And then we subsequently stripped the team and we've been shit ever since. There is no assuming. There is no assuming. Okay? This is one thing. Now, the only bit of mystery and the only thing that is not set in stone at this point is do we actually take a quarterback in the first round? Do we either get a high enough pick that we can take one or do they trade up and get one? One of those two, in my perspective, one of those two situations is going to play out. Either they're going to get a high enough pick in which they can just take a guy at whatever pick it is, or they fall far enough that they have to trade up to get uh, the quarterback that they want, right? So right now, as it stands, we have the fourth, the 16th, and the 25th picks. Now, especially with the way that, you know, our defense has taken hits with Rashad Jones and Bobby McCain now being on IR and so on and so forth, it is possible that we do just continue to lose games and we just lose the rest of them and, you know, we end up 2 and 14. That is possible. But it is also possible that we beat the Bengals and that we beat the Jets. Um, it's possible that we beat the Giants. Right, All of those teams, in fact, are teams that if we won those games, not only would it push our draft position down because we won, but also those are teams that are battling for the first or, or, or the top picks with us. So it's like a double loss in that regard. It hurts us and helps them simultaneously, which then pushes the, the, the gap and pushes us further down. Right? So... Um, it is still potentially possible that we do win some games. We'll see. Now, that part of it and what we actually do in this next draft is still, to be fair, not set in stone. But I think it's inconceivable that this team does not take a quarterback in the first round with all of the data and information that we have. So, anyway... Let's also assume Burrow is Cincinnati's target and Tua is out of consideration due to medical. What do you prefer? Well, if you guys know me and you guys know what I've been saying this entire time, I prefer that we just don't take a quarterback in the first round ever or the second as a matter of fact. Why? Because I'd rather build up the rest of the team around that quarterback, whatever whoever our quarterback is, I'd also make sure that they have a good defense. I'd like to take top talent available, um, what have you. And then again, the NFL and the fans and everybody puts far too much on quarterbacks when the evidence is clear that first round picks are far more often busts or just average than they are superstars or franchise quarterbacks. And furthermore, a good portion of the big names, including Dak Prescott, Tom Brady, Russell Wilson, were not taken in the first round. And in fact, were taken in mid to late rounds. Okay, so I would take a quarterback every year in round three or later. Never in the first or second round. I would build up my trenches. I would get top talent at skill position players in the first and second rounds. And that's how I would do it. Um, 
anyway, so that's about all I got for you guys. Like I said, there were some things I just wanted to talk about. Uh, anyway, so again, I, well, I suck at keeping things short because there's always so much to say, man. And, and look, at the end of the day, I know I end up, uh, you know, saying a lot of the same things and repeating myself, but it's because no matter how much I'm proven right or what have you, people just actively choose to deny the reality. And so I got to keep saying it. I got to keep saying it because if I don't, no one will. And then everybody's just going to be all dumbfounded and confused at the end of the day when it turns out exactly like I said, it's going to turn out right and so look again i don't care to be right that's not the important thing the, the thing that i care about is is presenting the facts and data and giving the best and most complete analysis that i possibly can for you guys so you can make up your minds uh on your own um you know but apparently the the fan base is still right around 70 percent, 75 percent confidence in this team and in the direction we're going so you know, with data like that as well, it just goes to show that I got to keep hammering this stuff away. And because the evidence overwhelmingly supports the things that I'm saying. So, um, yeah. Anyway, again, though, to be fair, there's still stuff. and But I do think it's unfortunate because I'm one of those kind of people that likes to try and get ahead of problems. Um uh, by being able to, you know, logically evaluate and assess problems that have not yet come to pass based off of information that I have and data that I have now that when calculated together logically leads to certain results. We are capable of that as human beings, right? I know we choose not to. I know human beings have this like affinity for never learning anything from their mistakes, but I choose to do the opposite um, to the best of my ability. And so, again, this video ended up being 45 minutes at this point, a little over. And so I'm terrible at keeping things short because of that stuff. But I have to because I'm the only voice, apparently, um, that's willing to say the things that I say. That makes sure to keep everything in full context, to give you all the data, to give you dissenting opinions and voices, despite the fact that I uh, disagree with them. Right? Because the DAX, the DAX, the, the data and the facts, the DAX, the data and the facts are what's most important. And the results based off of those data and facts are important. Um, and I like to give you the most complete, uh, you know, complete context and, and evaluation and so on and so forth. So with that, guys, I'm going to go ahead and get up out of here. I'm going to cut this. I hope you guys enjoy my videos and my perspective. If you do, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you hit the bell if you want to get the alerts. Make sure you share my channel and my videos with your friends and family. Leave your questions, comments, and concerns down in the comments section. And of course, as always, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Dylan Tartaro. And with that, I am out. I'll see you all soon. Fins up.